Welcome to the Casual Cinecast, powered by Cinelinks. My name is Chris. My name is Justin. And my name is Mike. Today's episode, we'll be going over what's on our minds, followed by our review of Spike Lee's Black Klansman. Yeah, if you want to follow along with what we're watching next or ask us any questions about what we're going to be talking about on the show, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Casual Cinecast, or you can email us directly at casualcinemedia at gmail.com. And please don't forget to go onto iTunes and give us a five-star rating and give us a review. Let us know what you think about the show. Give us your feedback, but just do it within the five-star rating so that we still look cool. Absolutely. It helps grow the show, and any feedback you have would be very helpful. On that note, we do have a couple of new iTunes reviews. Do you guys want to go over those right now? Yeah, let's do it. I'm always excited about those. Awesome. Let me bring it up here. All right, so the first review we've gotten since the last time we've gone over reviews is from Juan Motoa. And it says, The casual cinecast does a great job catering to both passionate cinephiles and the average moviegoer. Chris, Justin, and Mike all have great insight and always bring new observations to each movie. As a Criterion Collection fan and a person who loves hearing reviews of new movies, this podcast is a must. Subscribe! Exclamation point. Wow, that was really flattering. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Juan. That <laughs> was a really Juan great Motoa. review. Yeah. Cool. So next we have a review entitled Fantastic by the Jacera. And I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I don't know. But... This person says, really love these guys and what they bring to the table. If you're a fan of the Criterion Collection movies, this is definitely the route you want to go. Two big thumbs up. Awesome. I give that review two big thumbs up. Yeah, and a big toe up as well. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And our last one is titled, What a Treat. Uh, So this one's going to be a good one. It seems like it's uh, by Box Office Pulp. They say, started listening just yesterday and really liked what I heard. What I appreciated most was the lighthearted tone of the show, particularly the Criterion episodes. There are a ton of podcasts out there going through the Criterion collection, but they're all dreadfully pretentious. So hearing these movies discussed the same way my friends and I would uh, was a welcome relief. Also, welcome is the outstanding audio quality, an unfortunately rare thing in movie podcasts. We'll definitely keep listening. Well, that is the casual in our name. So I'm glad that that comes through. And then I would say our quality is specifically related to Mike and Justin going through film school. So thank you guys for giving us such good audio quality. Yeah, it made me unable to turn a blind eye to bad audio quality. Yeah. So, yeah. For sure. And special thanks to Box Office Pulp, for sure. Yeah, that review is awesome. And by the way, Box Office Pulp podcast, they're really great. Check them out. Cool. So is that it for reviews, right? Yeah, and with that, are we ready to move into what's on our minds? Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's do it. So, guys, who wants to go over what's on our minds? Yeah, I'll go over what uh, is on my mind. Uh, Oh, good job, Chris. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, I watched It Follows this week. Uh, Oh, nice. For the first time? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, It's a film that's directed by David Robert Mitchell, starring Micah Monroe and Keir Gilchrist. And it's about a girl that finds her life in danger after a sexual encounter. I'd actually been really looking forward to Under the Skin, or (laughs) Under the... uh, No, Under the Skin's a different movie that I still haven't watched, so I'm looking forward to that one. But the movie I'm talking about is Under the Silver Lake. Uh, And that's the new film by the same director of It Follows. So I, I figured I'd go back and see, check out his old movie. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, especially since Under the Silver Lake has been delayed. Uh, and visually, I think it's really good. I think the... And he's really good at setting up mood in it. Uh, yeah. And I think uh, there's some really interesting thematic things that are inventively put in there. And it uh, it actually made me really excited about Under the Silver Lake. So uh, what did you guys think about it? Yeah, well, first of all, Under the Skin is great. And you should definitely see it as soon as possible. Okay. Um, one of the best sci-fi movies... Uh, in the last 20 years. Oh, wow. I'll go ahead and say, yeah, if not the best. Um, Mm -hmm. As far as It Follows goes, yeah, this movie is just a blast. It's got such a great premise. And I honestly feel like you undersold it when giving the premise. So I'm going to give you the basic synopsis of It Follows real quick. So skip ahead 30 seconds if you don't want to hear it. But basically, after a girl has sex with her boyfriend, all of a sudden she's drugged and she basically wakes up and he's telling her, hey, you know, there is going to be this thing that is always walking after you. It's always following you no matter what, no matter how far you run, it is walking after you and it will catch you eventually if you don't get going. And it can come as anybody. 
anyone you've ever known. And so, or anyone you don't know. So anyway, I think that's just in itself an amazing premise for a movie. Yeah. And it's uh, really simple, which is yeah. the, uh, sometimes like the best way to do like a horror movie. Cause if you get too complicated with like plot and all these details, it's like, you're not spending enough time actually just being suspenseful and scary and being creative with those things, as opposed to just making a really complex plot. Right. Exactly. The plot could not be any simpler and any more just pure horror movie. You mm-hmm. know, it's like the perfect horror movie plot. And it's amazing to me that it's taken this long to just make this movie. <laughs> Anyway, that said, plot aside, the movie is actually really well acted, really well shot, like Chris mm-hmm. said. It's, it's beautifully shot. I will say it's not that scary, to be honest. I didn't find it scary necessarily, no. Yeah, but the, to me, that doesn't make it any less of a good horror movie, the fact that I wasn't actually scared. And I think the themes of it is interesting because, and I guess fast forward through the segment, but I'm going to say, like, she has to have sex with somebody else in order to pass it on. So it's... Like, the worst STD you could ever get, right? Yeah. Uh, and I think that that's really interesting, too. And just yeah, that... there's, like, there's moral questions involved. Yeah, it's it's a really interesting movie. I, I wish we could do a deep dive on it, maybe later, but uh, because I think there's a lot of good stuff to talk about in this film. Yeah. Does it make you more or less excited for Under the Silver Lake? Oh, yeah, I'm definitely more excited. I've heard some bad things about Under the Silver Lake, but I think, at the very minimum, Under the Silver Lake is going to be a good movie to look at. It may not be a good movie, but I think it's going to be uh, a really pretty film to watch. Yeah, I think that my favorite thing about It Follows is that the director gives you a lot of credit as an audience member and doesn't really like spoon-feed you a lot of things. Or at least there are these moments that I remember in the film where I figured out something based on the way that it was shot. And based on the things that are in the frame without anyone having to point it out in dialogue or without, you know, really obvious filmmaking pointing me to think exactly what I'm supposed to think. It's like Mm -hmm. I could actively participate in scenes to figure out like, oh, where is that actually someone that we know? Is that the real person or is that right? The the it, I guess. Yeah, he embraces. I loved that. Yeah, he embraces the show. Don't tell method of storytelling for film. Right. And even like show, but don't over show, I guess. <laughs> like yeah. subtly show. Yeah. Yeah. And it's hard to really go into details about what yeah. exactly you're talking about, but I know right. what you're talking about. And there are scenes <laughs> that are set up very, uh, very cleverly at the beginning of the movie that pay off. But the thing is, if you don't catch it, uh, it does not ruin the movie for you at all. It's just an extra bonus thing that makes the movie better if you do catch it. Yeah, and if you don't catch it the first time, we'll make it better on a repeat viewing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, it follows uh, one of my favorite horror movies of recent years, for sure. Yeah, Same. absolutely. Yeah. Cool. So, uh, Mike, what is on your mind? Yeah. So there has been a lot of talk this week about changes to the way the Oscars telecast is going to be done this year. I'm sure you guys have heard of this. Sure have. Yep. It looks like what's going on is this coming up Oscars broadcast is going to be cut down to three hours maximum, which means that they're going to have to cut some corners if they want to fit the entire ceremony into the the time block, right? Basically, because the Oscars always are over three hours and they're always, even at that point, still cutting people off and speeches and things like that. Um, then to top it off, they have also added another category which is the big news and so what they've done is they have added uh, an oscar for out is it outstanding achievement in popular film yes yep. i believe so okay that's the technical okay yeah yeah and this has basically been known to be called the most popular film category mm-hmm. let me ask you guys it seems like everyone on social media has been freaking out about this and they are not happy with the change at all and so th- The way I see it is there is a glass half full way to look at this. But then I also see the glass half empty outlook that a lot of people have been, you know, screaming at the top of their lungs about. What do you guys think? So for me, I mean, I I don't necessarily care how long the uh, ceremony is, right? Like if it's been four hours before and that's fine because I'm into the Oscars or, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm like aware of the movies and it's not a ton of movies I've never heard of or anything like that. So I'm always fine with the length Mm that they shorten it. I guess that's okay, but it doesn't really matter to me. But the category, I think like 
to me, I, I've seen so much talk over the, I, I guess it would be like past 10 years. I remember really starting a lot with mm-hmm. the dark Knight when it came out in 2008, I believe. Yeah. Um, there was a lot of people that wanted that to get nominated for best picture and thought it should. And uh, Mm -hmm. of course it didn't get nominated. Right. And that's when they introduced, that's when they introduced like the 10 best picture the next year. Yeah. They reacted to that as well. Yeah. So that they could open it up to more movies. Mm -hmm. Of course the other movies that got in there because of that still weren't movies like the dark Knight. Right. Right. Maybe like avatar was the most popular mainstream or one of the most popular mainstreams I can think of that's been nominated. But anyways, there's, there's been such a call for like the the Oscars to include more films like the dark Knight or more blockbustery type films that are r- really good. And this is obviously a step from them to do that. But now it seems like once they've done that, people are upset about it. And to me, I think, you know, I think to me, to me, it's like, I'm just happy with what I get, right? Like there's not really any, I can't think of any like actual negative harm to come out of this. Basically. It's like, a, it's kind of like a might as well. That's cool to me. Yeah. So you're kind of uh, more glass half full on this, right? So you're looking at it as like, why not? You know? Sure. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So let me respond to a couple things there. So, yeah, we started watching the Oscars probably about the same time, you and I, because we kind of got into, quote unquote, good movies probably around the same time. Right. Um, Right. I also don't personally care if the Oscars telecast is longer, but I think what they're responding to is the lack of ratings that's been going on in the Oscars, especially last year. But really on a long enough timeline, if you bring out the chart, it's just steadily declining in ratings right a lot of that comes from people watching things on the internet the next day and watching highlight reels and things like that so the way we're watching things is changing we're streaming a lot more and they should really focus on that but ultimately i imagine what's going to happen if they're shortening the oscar from like four hours to three hours the things that are going to get hurt are like the technical awards i'm imagining right like um, yeah, and maybe the best song performances well, best song can go. I don't think anyone wants that thing to stay around, right? Musicians, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. But well, they can still give the award. They just don't have to sing every song. Right. There you go. That's, yeah, that's yeah. what I'm thinking. Uh, but I will not be upset if ultimately they can fit this in in a classy way in three hours, fit the new categories in, and also not make you go to abc.com or whatever to see the acceptance speech of whoever one best sound mixing. Yeah, in the I think what they said that they were going to edit it, they would give the awards during the commercials and then they would edit a highlight reel before the end of the show and then show you that way. See, that seems weird and an insult to everyone who wins that award from here on out. Yeah. Like I, it doesn't I, mean as much as it did last year. So my thoughts are, I, I definitely don't like the three hour shortening. I mean, it is a long uh, process, uh, but so is the Super Bowl, Right. Uh, but of course, maybe do- this doesn't get the ratings that the Super Bowl does. No, definitely not. Yeah, but but so is the Super Bowl. Dedicate a night to it. You know, I, I don't know. I-, I feel like it's an insult to the people that are going to get those awards that are cut out, you know, and it- it's just kind of a bummer. I never see the short films, and I, I feel like the short films, the animated short film and, you know, the live action short films, those are the ones that are going to get cut out. I never watch them, and maybe I sh- should more actively go out to sure. watch those short films. On the other side, with the popular film category, I'm a little bit more trepidatious about it than Justin is, I think. I think I just don't know enough. Like, what what are the qualifications for a popular film? If the qualification is that it has to make X amount of money, I'm against that. I mean, that that's just the monetization of the Oscars, you know, like... I just feel like if it has to make so much money to be a popular film, I just feel like then they're just giving an Oscar because they want people to watch the Oscars. And I I just I just I'm a little bit leery about. Well, okay, so let me respond to that real quick. Okay, I have no problems with them making changes and trying to make specific changes that will get them more ratings. They have to survive. They right. have to, it's like religion. You know what I mean? It's like, if you stick by the old ways long enough, you're going to alienate all the young people. And pretty soon you're going to wake up and there's going to be no one left to carry on your religion. Right. 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 You need to make changes for the young people and how young people are watching and consuming things. Mm-hmm. Right. And I totally understand needing to nominate 
Black Panther or whatever, because that's what people are really there to see. Us film snobs who like the Academy Awards, we can stick our noses up in the air and be like, popular film category, what does that even mean? But ultimately, I think what it boils down to is movies like Black Panther, unless this category exists, or Dark Knight, they're never going to get nominated for Best Picture because although they are popular and although they are seen more, let's get real. They're not the best movies of the year, usually, right? Otherwise, they would probably win. So yeah. if you want to see these things get nominated and get the attention, this is the way to see it happen. So my question to you about that would be that they're the popular films. They don't need attention. Like, uh, they've already made enough money. Black Panther doesn't need right. any more money. So but what I'm saying is, is the Academy Awards and the Oscars aren't for people who are going after the most popular film. The Oscars are trying to get more people to watch. The people who watch the Oscars already and the people who have been watching the Oscars and the people who vote in the Academy like those, you know, artsy Academy Awards types films, right? Yeah. Although you, it, the argument is there that, like, if it's a popular movie, it's a popular movie, and that should be all there is to it. There is a certain thing to be said for that, but those aren't the people voting in the Academy, yeah. You know what I mean? So basically, this is like a consolation prize, which is what it is. But I don't see that as a bad thing because it's a way to get young people to tune into the ceremony because Black Panther or Mad Max Fury Road or Mission Impossible Fallout or whatever is nominated for something. That's the only thing they've seen. They want to see which of the popular movies is going to win. And then all of a sudden they're hearing about new artsier movies they've never heard of. Yeah, that's a so good argument. It's a net good, in my opinion, but I think it's ultimately dangerous if they don't explain how the popular film is chosen. Yeah, that's kind of where I stand. We don't know because, yeah. what, what they are, and that's, like, I reserve my judgment until we find out the rules of the popular film. The dilemma I see would be, if it's nominated for one, it can't get nominated for Best Picture, right? Like, it's already got its consolation prize, so now, even if a movie does deserve it, it won't be nominated or considered for Best Picture the way, like, Best Animated isn't. You yeah, know what I mean? There's a lot of animated films that have come out, especially from Pixar, the last 10 years or so, that could have been Best Picture. But because there's a Best Animated, uh, it gets passed over for Best exactly. Picture. Exactly. Exactly. Well, there, there have been animated films that have been nominated for Best Picture, and they just didn't win. Uh, it's it's true, but also uh, it could be argued that one of the reasons they probably didn't win and never stood a chance of winning is because that Best Animated Film category exists. I, the last one I remember being nominated for Best Picture is Beauty and the Beast. Is there uh, Toy Story there, Three? Right? Was that nominated up, for Best Picture? Toys. I don't know about Toy Story Three. Maybe, but Up was definitely nominated yeah, uh, for Best. A picture. few Pixar's have been nominated for sure. Oh, up was wow. absolutely nominated for Best Picture. Okay, cool. That's awesome. So I, I, I'm not going to say that they can't be nominated. And if something's good enough to win, then maybe it'll happen. But as you, as you said, Mike, like the films that are going to most likely populate this category more often than not aren't going to be the films that deserve to win Best Picture anyways. So like while it is a concern that you can't win both popular film category and Best Film category, right? the chances that a film is going to deserve it and not get that. Right. Uh, it's pretty slim. So I think we're, we're kind of worried about a pretty big improbability. Yeah. And that's ultimately where I come down to, which is why I think I'm more glass half full, like I said earlier. But I do totally understand all the people that are hesitant going forward because it definitely seems like this is just, you know, uh, Disney stepping in and strong arming everybody. Yes. Yeah, so, I have a, a kind of controversial opinion here and I would say that the ratings, the reason the ratings have gone down uh, in the most recent years isn't necessarily because of the length or the popular movies. And I don't necessarily agree with this opinion, but I think politics have a lot to do with it. I think because we're so divisive in our politics uh, and there's a lot of politics, going on during the Oscars, I think that that's why viewership has gone down. I'm sure that's part of it. If you if you think 50% of the country is, you know, conservative or conservative conservative leaning, then that's would be roughly 50% of the country that probably won't tune in because there is no matter what a very yeah. big hatred towards like liberal quote liberal Hollywood. Yeah, so anything else on the the Oscar thing? Are we all just kind of a... It sounds like we're all a bit wait and see, too. You know, see how it goes. Yeah. yeah. It kind of pans I think, out. I think we'll revisit this when and if we get the rules uh, for the best popular 
picture and probably when the Oscars come out again uh, as well in February. But yeah, I'm waiting to see for sure. Do you have any idea of like what you would like best popular, you know, criteria to be? Ooh, that's a good question. Just off the top of your heads, it's not yeah. really that important. Yeah, I, I would think s- it should be uh, like viewer, like non Academy members are able to vote on it. Ooh, that that'd be weird. Okay, I don't know yeah. how they would do that, but I think that's the way to like take out a lot of the controversy, mm-hmm. right? Which is like yeah. if it's supposed to be best popular film, let the Academy choose all the films they want to choose, and then let the public have their own category. Yeah, that makes like sense. The for end sure. of the night, and that way it doesn't affect the integrity of the normal best picture race. Uh, but you still have like people viewing things because they have their own like skin in the game, you know? Yeah, I would say what, what I... What if it was... Go ahead. Go, go ahead, Chris. I, I would say basically mine is if it's based on money, I'm out. <laughs> you know, like if they're like it has to make so much money, I, I like... That's but let me ask you why. this, why? If I, it's best popular film, why isn't the, the yeah, people hall are voting in the box office uh, a valid yeah. indicator? It just feels kind of dirty to me I, I i don't know exactly how to explain that uh it just feels like i i don't want it to be based on money it feels like it's they're basing like this is a popular movie because it made the most everything's money. based on money the entire the, broadcast is designed right. this way so they can try to make money nothing it, means anything it's all money man right no but, I, I understand but it being so overt is you know like so what movies are going to be nominated would it be black panther or so this year it would be Avengers Infinity War is number one right now. Uh, Incredibles is number two. You know, would we just nominate the f- top five movies that inv- made the most money? And is I mean, that, that an makes incredible the most, That makes more sense to me than... So are we giving an Oscar for the movie that made the most? Like, so, oh. No, because it still gets voted on. Yeah, it still gets voted on. If it's the most popular movie, popular being the key word there, not the most, like, it's movie best deserving movie, of not award. most popular. Right. But even then, it's still... It does. It just doesn't. What's, what feel... indicates popularity more than box office? No, I, you're completely right. Uh, like that is what uh, indicates popular. You know, but it just it just feels weird to me, and it, I, I don't want I don't want it to be based on money, and that's just a, a strong feeling I have. You know, like I, it's I probably I don't want to like you know rain on your parade, but that's <laughs> you're probably gonna be disappointed. No, yeah. and that's <laughs> I mean you should like probably this. like a different art form. <laughs> no, well, and it's not I, even like, well, I can like a movie, you know, it doesn't necessarily matter how much money. I liked Avengers, you know, I just... Right. Uh, I don't know. I just... I get what you're saying. It it seems like it's opening the door for like um, shady and like political things more than like the merit of the film. But in a category like best achievement in, or most outstanding achievement in popular film... Uh, you know, I'm not saying box office is the best way to go because I think like public voting somehow, if you could do that would be the best way to do it. That's not a, an indicator that I think is like necessarily inherently wrong given what the category itself is, you know? Yeah. I just, uh, feels weird. I have a and we'll weird see what idea. It's... What if, what if in order to be eligible for it, you have to have been number one at the box office at some point, like in like one week for at least one week. That makes which me... is basically which is basically money, but it doesn't actually look at numbers, money numbers technically. I don't see a difference in that, to be honest. I I don't either, but it would just be a funny kind of weird criteria. Yeah, I don't know. We'll see. Uh, we'll see what happens, and we'll revisit. What if, it had to, talk it, about it. What if it had to be two weeks then? <laughs> I which mean, it's still money, but hmm. yeah, and there's. There are movies that uh, are number one for a week that make it to Best Picture, you know, uh, so that, that would exactly. be interesting. But So, yeah, I guess the difference would be that something that's number one in December might not come any come close to making as much money as something that's number two in July. Right. Yeah, it's had a lot like more a time. Off. Yeah. Um, at least in terms of the money that it makes, like something in June or July during the summer movie season might make a lot more money than something that's number one. Well, that's during a, November or December. A really good point. So something like uh, Avengers or Black Panther that has had has been in the theater for has had a full theatrical run against something that has came out in December didn't have three months in the theaters. You know, it only had one month, so it has no chance. Yeah. 
Yeah. Based if they were going on that category. Yeah, I agree, which is why it's problematic. And I think uh, they shouldn't do it that way. But <laughs> I don't either. I just thought it would be a fun. Yeah. Well, even even the to top, top, <laughs> top five would be uh, a problem there, too. Anyways, it's interesting. Uh, and we'll see what happens. So ready to move on? Yeah, I am. So I'm, I'm up next and last. And this week, I wanted to talk about the movie Room which is uh, just room, not the room, for clarity. Important distinction. Oh, hi, Mark. Not that one. Oh. That was uh, a very so, good impression, Chris. <laughs> All yeah, my impressions was... are good. <laughs> so this movie uh, is on Netflix now, which is why I've finally watched it. And yeah, it's it came out in 2015. It's directed by Lenny Abrahamson. Ooh, that's a weird name to say. Abramson, I guess, would be the right way to say that. <laughs> So this movie came out in 2015. It's directed by Lenny Abramson, stars Brie Larson and Jacob Tremblay. And I assume both of you guys have seen this movie, but just in case you haven't, this is about Brie Larson and her five-year-old son, played by Jacob Tremblay, and they are held captive in a room. And he's five years old. He was born in this room. She's been in the room for, I think, roughly six, seven years or something when the movie starts. And yeah, it's about them being captive inside a room and a good chunk of the film takes place inside of that room. And I have heard amazing things about this film. Great things. Brie Larson's amazing in it. Jacob Tremblay's amazing in it, etc. And uh, I have to say, I was a little disappointed when I watched it. Like it's not a bad movie by any means. It's certainly good. And, you know, I started it pretty late into the evening where I was worried I might fall asleep or something, or get, you know, too sleepy to to pay attention, but it kept my interest the whole way through. And, yeah, it's there's nothing bad about it, and it's good, but I, I guess it just didn't quite live up to the hype for me. I, I thought that it, it didn't really hit me on any sort of emotional level like I expected based on reactions. So what, what did you guys think of the movie? Uh, I loved it. I disagree with you uh, every word you said, almost. <laughs> um, you disagree that I was disappointed? Yeah, I do. No, um, I, I saw it in theaters. Um, I remember I hadn't heard any word of mouth about it. I hadn't even like looked into the movie before sitting down in the theater to see it. Um, so I had no word of mouth whatsoever uh, around it. Uh, I remember very distinctly watching Room, and I don't know what point in the movie, but there's a point, I guess probably halfway through the movie, where... My heart was beating really fast. I didn't know what was going to happen. And like, it could have gone anywhere at that point. And I had no idea, you know? Um, right. I know what you're talking about. I'm yeah. Sure. I would say that the first half of the movie is better than the second half of the movie. But the whole I thing agree. to me um, is very rewarding in watching. And, and I found it to be very emotional. So, um, yeah, I... I I liked it quite a bit and I don't know what the word of mouth is, but based on my own personal reaction from that movie, I would assume it's all glowing. Like you said. Yeah, Um, it definitely is. Everything I've heard about it has been that. Yeah. So I, I, I mean, I'm in that camp, but that's also coming from, like I said, a guy who knew nothing about it before sitting down in the theater to watch it. Yeah. Yeah. Chris, have you seen it? Uh, yeah, I'm not going to be able to weigh in on this one. Uh, maybe I'll watch it this week and I can weigh in next week and s- you can find out how- what I thought. But I haven't seen it. I've heard great things. I, I watched Short Term 12 recently and uh, along the Brie Larson filmography, The Room or Room was my next stop. So I haven't watched it yet. I'll say that there are moments in the movie that are great, that are really good. And, and what you're talking about, Mike, we're again, we're having to be general here because we don't want to spoil it for you, Chris, or anybody who's listening who haven't seen it. But uh, I know we're talking about there's a a moment or two towards the end of the film that I got relatively emotional in, but I I definitely agree with you that the first half of the movie is better because I, and I think that's maybe where the issue came because the first half was so good that the second half didn't live up to how good the first half was for me. Like I kind of became less and less interested it's like As it's two movies. It's like it's a thriller and also a heavy, heavy drama at right. once. And and I guess it's just it seemed like once they moved on, the territory that they went into and the the themes that they explored didn't 
didn't really go in what I thought would be the most interesting thing or what I was most interested in about the characters and the story. You know what I mean? I do. But again, I just, I don't know, man. I, I, I understand what you're saying and it makes sense to me, but I, this is not the reaction I had. And I think it may just be a consequence of not seeing a movie around the time that it comes out before, you know, you, you hear all about it. You before see the Oscars. It finds its place in pop culture. And yeah. yeah. And, and I guess that's part of what I wanted to talk about too, is just, I, you know, I talked about a few months ago, I saw Gone Girl, right? And that movie had a, a bunch of stuff around it. And then it kind of died off enough for me to not hear about it anymore. So when I watched it, I was like really impressed by it and kind of taken by surprise at how good it was. And this, this is obviously kind of the opposite, but it's kind of the same thing, right? Which is, I didn't see a movie when, at the time that it came out. So, you know, with Gone Girl, I thought this was a film that didn't get enough recognition when it probably did. And then the room is like, I've heard too, it's, it's maybe too, I didn't wait long enough to watch it or I didn't see it when it came out. So the hype is still like, it's too big. I think that it was hard to not, for the movie to not disappoint me at that point. Yeah. That makes sense. I suppose. Yeah. I could see that. Yeah. I'm uh, I'm super disappointed in you. <laughs> in but, Justin. Yeah. <laughs> You've but let me okay. down. There I'm are sorry. other movies out there. That's yeah. actually why we have the podcast is to disagree and talk about why we disagree or agree about movies. For sure. <sighs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, does anyone have anything else before we move into our review of Black Klansman? No, I, I'm no, excited. I'm, to I'm get ready to talk one. about this one. Yeah. All right, let's do it. There's never been a black cop in this city. We think you might be the man to open things up around here. Hello, this is Ron Stallworth calling. Well, who am I speaking with? This is David Duke. Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. That David Duke? God. Last time I checked. What can I do you for? Well, since you asked, I hate blacks. I hate Jews, Mexicans, and Irish, Italians, and Chinese. But my mouth to God's ears, I really hate those black rats. And anyone else, really, that doesn't have pure white Aryan blood running through their veins. I'm happy to be talking to a true white American. God bless white America. The KKK is planning an attack. How do you propose to make this investigation? We'll establish contact over the phone. We'll need a white officer to play me when they meet face to face. You for the white race, Ron? Oh, hell yeah. So there becomes a combined Ron Stallworth. Can you do that? With the right white man, we can do anything. All right, so before we get going on Black Klansmen, just wanted to let you know that if you haven't seen the movie yet, you can keep listening. We're not going to be giving any spoilers away for the next little while. And before we do, we're going to give you a nice big spoiler alert so that you can stop the podcast, go see the movie, come back, finish the podcast. Yes, you're welcome. Yeah, good job, us. <laughs> so, Black Klansman, written and directed by Spike Lee, uh, as well as written by some other people. Uh, it's got a lot of writing credits on it. Yeah, it does. Uh, it's like four. Yeah. And uh, produced by Jordan Peele, starring John David Washington, Adam Driver, and Laura Harrier. The IMDb synopsis says, Ron Stallworth, an African-American police officer from Colorado, successfully managed to infiltrate the local Ku Klux Klan and become the head of the local chapter. Yeah. I have uh, issues with the synopsis, but it, it's something we probably don't want to get into until... Spoilers. So yeah, so yeah, and it's I not agree. so much an issue with the synopsis as it is other things. <laughs> okay, well, uh, the synopsis isn't not quite accurate to the entire movie, but it's also trying to not spoil you on some stuff. So uh, ultimately, it's fine. It's a serviceable synopsis. Yeah, for sure. It's also worth mentioning that this is a uh, based on a book written by the real life Ron Stallworth, and this whole thing's based on a true story, at least according to Ron Stallworth in his book. Indeed. So, guys, who wants to go first? I can go first. Okay. All right. So the synopsis, uh, a black man infiltrates the Klan. That piques my interest, and I want to watch the film, right? And as far as Spike Lee goes, uh, he's made some really, really good movies. 
but lately he's been really hit or miss. So I was definitely interested in seeing whether or not uh, this movie would be a, a return to form for Spike Lee. And so that was kind of my interest in this film. And uh, yeah, I was definitely interested in watching it and excited. So yeah, what did you think, Mike? So yeah, I'm right there with you. I was interested because of all the buzz it got around Can. But usually Spike Lee is not a filmmaker that I'm on the lookout for. I like some Spike Lee movies for sure. Uh, I like some of them quite a bit, but there's also some I've seen that I don't like at all. But I've always enjoyed his attitude and his activism in his career. And I feel like he's made the most of his career and done all things that he finds interesting. And, uh, you know, to that degree, I respect Spike Lee quite a bit. Yeah. But ultimately... He's never been one of my favorites. Yeah. So, Justin, what about you? What were your expectations for the movie? I had pretty minimal ones. Like, I didn't read any of the thoughts about it coming out of any film festival or anything like that. I've seen a few Spike Lee movies, not very many. The ones that I've liked, I've just liked, not loved. And the ones that I didn't like, I really didn't like. So, he's never been someone that... I've been excited to see the next movie for like, if you told me Spike Lee has a new movie come out coming out, I wouldn't automatically be sold on it. Like I would some other directors, right? I would need to watch the trailer. Yeah. See, or, you know, at least hear like the plot of the movie. Right. And so with this one, the plot of the movie intrigues me. Yeah. I watched the trailer when it came out. Cause I, I think one of you guys posted it or like sent it over to us to, to watch it. And um, I thought the trailer looked Okay. I didn't think it looked good, but I thought it, I thought it looked like it was it was an okay trailer. Maybe there's a good movie behind the trailer. That was kind of where I was going in. All right, so uh, Chris, do you want to go same order? What were your thoughts on the overall movie? What did they end up being? I, I liked the trailer. Um, I thought it looked funny, and to that aspect, I think the movie delivered on what the trailer promised. I thought it was really funny and interesting. And it also really surprised me about how powerful the film was uh, to me and how kind of worked up it made me. Yeah, it, I thought it was really good. I, I, I think this movie for Spike Lee is a, a call to action. And I, I think on that level, it works really well. And I, I think uh, Washington and uh, Driver both give really good performances. So I have a, a lot more to say about this, but I'm not going to say it here. I'm going to let you guys talk and then we'll get into it as we go through the spoilers and the non-spoilers. There's a lot to talk about in this film. And I think you should definitely go see it and take a friend and then go get a cup of coffee and sit and talk about it afterwards. Because... I think that's what this movie is for, is to spark conversation and, yeah, go see it for sure. Mike, how do you feel about this film? Yeah, so I uh, pretty much mostly agree with what you said. Uh, I think this movie feels like Spike Lee trying to educate more than entertain. Um, I think this mm -hmm. movie is entertaining for the most part, but um, it feels more like a deliberate statement, like you were saying. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's funny, it's sad, it's shocking. And terrifying all at once. I think the cast is really good. Uh, John David Washington is charming. Adam Driver is likable, as always. Um, it's cool to see Topher Grace trying some new stuff and doing some roles that you don't normally see a guy like Topher Grace doing. Yeah, overall, I enjoyed it. I found it to be effective and well done. Like most people, I do feel like, at least a lot of the critiques I've heard of this movie, I feel like a lot of it is pretty on the nose. And at first, that kind of bothered me. Like a lot of the dialogue and a lot of the scenes feel like they're trying to hold your hand. But when the movie is over, ultimately, I think I end up coming down on the fact that like uh, that's just what it wants to do. You know, it is trying to hold your hand uh, because I, I'm convinced Spike Lee has no faith in people anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, and I agree with him for the most part when it comes to that. So I feel like this movie is just as blatant and bashing you over the head with its point as it needs to be. What about you, Justin? Yeah, so for me, I think first and foremost, this is more of a message than a movie, which is kind of echoing what you guys have said mm -hmm. a bit. And as far as the message goes, like I'm with it. And, and as you said, Mike, it's certainly not subtle at all, right? And Spike Lee has never really been one to, to be subtle. Yeah, but even for Spike Lee, movies. this is like him turned up to 11. <laughs> for sure. I, I agree with that too. Uh, but but I guess like the lack of subtlety wasn't necessarily surprising. Maybe at times it was a little surprising at how 
not subtle it was. But I think that if you are okay with this message and like on board with his side, then you're not going to mind being bashed over the head with it as you are in this film. Right. The message, while I agree with it, some of the execution of it bothers me. But before we get too deep into that, uh, I'll, I'll talk about it as a movie. And you kind of said this too, Mike, but as a movie, I don't like it at all. I thought it was not necessarily bad, but just nothing good about it to me. Like I didn't enjoy a single bit of this movie other than what parts of the message I could enjoy. Right. And I'll go as far to like almost be the complete opposite of what Chris said, because I thought that the main actor, John David Washington and Adam driver, both were completely uninteresting and not compelling as characters to watch. Like I I couldn't have been more bored during any scene that they were doing anything in. Yeah. I disagree with that for sure. (laughs) I I know that you guys do, but like it, I just, I was so bored. I, I, I even like, why subtly pulled out my, well, I mean, we can dive into it, I guess, but uh, like I, at certain points or at a certain point, I pulled out my phone to check the runtime on the movie because I was just ready for it to be over. Cause like, it just was not doing it for me. I was not into it. I mean, I thought there were performances and, and part of it, I blame on script as well, because there's so much dialogue in the script that is just on the nose and not subtle and not really clever at all that. I think it gets in the way of the movie. And this kind of goes back to what I was saying. The movie is like first and foremost, a message. I think that Spike Lee was not nearly as concerned with like having a great script as he was having a script that got across a great message. I just, I, there was nothing funny in the film. There was nothing intense or suspenseful for me at all. Man. It's did, it just like, it could not have failed on any more levels really for did me. You go, did you go to the same movie that we did? Maybe you walked into the wrong theater. <laughs> I'm not sure. I mean, can, can you elaborate on something you didn't like, though? So I, we'll go to like the, the KKK members, right? Like personally, I thought that they kind of fell into that too goofy to actually be taken very seriously. Like I thought Spike Lee spent a lot of time making them out to be like just kind of goofy, weird, oddball people as opposed to being serious threats most of the movie. Like maybe there's one or two of them, but like there's a one of them that's like kind of a bigger guy who was also in I, Tanya. I don't know the actor's name off the top of my head, but he's in it and he's like really, really silly. And it kind of fell into that category back when we reviewed the first season of Barry, where like the Chechens were supposed to be like goofy bad guys. And it just didn't really work for me there. And it was the same thing here. Like it didn't work for me here. Either. Let me, let me ask you as far as it goes with the KKK members, because birth of a nation plays such a big role in this and the caricatures of black people that are shown in that movie do you think spike lee is trying to do the same thing except for with the kkk i mean it's possible that's how i took it it's possible and i and i understand that but and i i kind of understand why he's doing a lot of the things and making the choices he's making but when it comes to like a movie or the film as a movie like that doesn't necessarily make a good movie just because like i said i think he's making a good message before he's making a good movie But that's what the movie is trying to be, though. So let me ask you this. Uh, When you left, though, regardless of the movie, did the message resonate with you at all? Like, were you were you shaken by this? Because being vague, since we're still in non spoilers, but the ending has a lot of people um, talking about the movie. Right. Like when people coming away from the movie, I think the ending is where all the impact lies. If the ending weren't the way it was, The the movie would just be a silly nothing buddy movie without a thesis. Yeah. Um, I mean, I mean, to an extent that's, that's my point. Right. So, but, uh, but, but what, and then, what I'm saying is for what that movie is trying to be and what it's trying to do, Chris and I found that to be effective. And I don't think we're looking at it the same way as we're looking at like, um, you know, Logan Lucky starring Adam driver, right. Or, or something like that. Well, so it's like, like I said at the beginning of those thoughts was that, I want to talk about the movie as, as a movie, like as that part of it, I, that's what I really don't like. That's what I'm saying. Like, sure. I, I just, don't I know, know what you mean. You can that, separate like, it because of, cause it's such a singular idea that I don't know if you can take like a movie like this, like a message movie and be like, look, let's just remove the message from it and take it just as the movie itself, which it was never trying to be. Well then, I mean, why then Competing. if it's all about the message, like I could have, gotten the message from a lot of the same footage in a six minute YouTube video, as opposed to a a two hour and 15 minute movie. 
Yeah, all right. Okay. I <laughs> right. I mean, that's that's how I felt. I, like I don't the, agree, but I hear what you're saying. Yeah. I, so that's why I want to. I mean, I want to talk about it a little bit on the like the terms of it being a movie, and as you both. I think, or at least Chris said that like, you know, the trailer looked funny or whatever. And I think it was kind of presented almost as like a comedy to an extent. Like that was what the premise felt like to me. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say I disagree with you. I mean, as a movie, I like this movie. Uh, yeah, I, I agree thought, with Chris I, even. It could have not had the end and I would have enjoyed this as a movie and I would have still been probably a little bit upset about stuff uh yeah and and the way things work i thought it was funny uh yeah i think let's how do we want to go about this do we want to dive into spoilers now or are there a couple things we want to talk about uh specifically about the movie that before we get into spoilers okay so ultimately before we move on into spoilers i just wanted to say and i, I kind of hinted on this earlier i think a lot of what spike lee is trying to do is he is trying to hold people's hands in this movie it feels like um, given the current political climate and his politics, he is not giving anyone the benefit of the doubt anymore. And I can see how that would turn some people off because he does go a little more on the nose than he needs to to make his point. But I would also say that I watched this movie like in a very crowded theater and my whole experience of the movie was kind of colored by this theater viewing experience, right? Because I had so many people I could actually hear in the theater having audible reactions to a lot of these like, um, like mic drop moments, you know, that feel like maybe they're a little on the nose. Like there is a line in this movie at one point where they kind of explain to people who don't follow the news and don't have like the political memory to go back. They kind of explain how a lot of modern day policies and politics are really rooted in racism uh, and it's kind of acceptable to talk about in public because they're not outright being racist. Um, and there's a point in the movie where one character says to John David Washington's character, they say like, you know, eventually these, uh, these issues will become so prevalent that one day someone who embodies the very idea of these like non-racist racist issues will be elected into the white house. And he says, no, no one would ever elect anyone like David Duke to the White House, to which his superior says to him, you know, for a black guy, you're pretty naive. Yeah, I think and, that was probably one of the more egregious errors. Like at that point, they could have turned and winked at the camera. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And I initially was like, I wasn't bothered by it, but I was able to recognize like, well, that wasn't subtle at all. And if this were like a serious movie where I was trying to lose myself in it, that would bother me. But ultimately, the theater I was in, I could hear at least three people react to that, that line, as if they had dropped some kind of knowledge bomb on them that they had never connected the dots to before, you know? like I had people laugh in the theater at that moment. Yeah, I had people yeah. laugh, but I literally had a guy be like, damn, you know, like, <laughs> and and so like I could hear it working on some people. So here's the way I look at it. Like this won't be in my top 10 of the year, but I was in the theater. I was, I could feel the energy in the auditorium and I could feel like this almost punk rock feeling of anger, like a middle finger from Spike Lee being like, look, if you don't agree, you're wrong. And it's, it's not even a political stance. It's a moral stance, you know, more of this and less like remakes of old boy, you know, uh, all the way. <laughs> right. Oh, I forget he did that. I never saw it. Cause why? <laughs> Yeah, I definitely agree with you, Mike. That this is a direct reaction. I mean, it's been a year. I don't know when they started making this film and stuff, but the Charlottesville rally. This was the uh, the year anniversary, one year anniversary mm -hmm. when it came out. So this is definitely a reaction to either our current president or that situation. Um, and it's he's definitely fucking angry. And yeah, so and for good reason, I think it's not like he's coming down against. A political side like i said i think it's more of a moral stance like i don't think you know the kkk is defensible in any way shape or form right so i don't this movie will divide people because of its politics but i don't think it should but i think it's an inevitable um symptom of a movie like this i don't think it's going to divide people and i would say the reason for that is because the people that it would divide aren't going to go see this movie oh that's probably true i would say I would say go read some of the uh, negative IMDb reviews. 
Oh, really? Well, I don't even think that they <laughs> if win. You, if you think it won't divide people. But I, I bet those IMD people, IMDB people did not even go see the movie. They're just trolling. Well, that's a potential <laughs> issue with the movie, depending on your viewpoint, right? Like, if, you, if you're okay with something just, you know, sort of existing within, like, an echo chamber and rallying the people that are already likely to be on its side or already on its side, then... You know, I would say that the movie's successful. I, I think that it's not going to get anybody to cross the aisle. No, but you know? I would say I don't think it's trying to get anyone to cross the aisle. But what it is trying to do is it's trying to motivate the people that are already on its side who are apathetic and don't vote, as well as trying to incorporate people who will be on this side who are currently politically uninvolved. Yeah, I agree. I think this movie is a call to action. Uh, exactly. Because w when I first walked out of the theater, I was like, w what does it matter? This movie is preaching to the choir. You know, everybody that goes to see this movie. But then I was like, wait, it it's a call to action for those people. You know, for the people that are already on that side. He's like, wake up, guys. Come on. We got to do something. You know, Or young people who just don't know what's going on and don't follow the news. Yeah. Makes sense. I mean, I, I think that this movie, it's very timely and it's very important for people to go see i think because you know despite how much i don't like the action the, the like story and entertainment value of this movie the message is is one that people should hear and even the people who reject it should probably hear it but you know like you like you guys said the people who are on that side already or maybe would be on that side if they knew like it's important for people to see i think i wouldn't say because it's a bad movie don't go see it i just want to at least for me like it, if my expectations had been more in line, maybe I would have been it, like been able to focus on the right things more as opposed to like wait for the movie to get maybe just a little bit entertaining for, for me, in my opinion, you know, so uh, th that's where I come down on it. Makes sense. So I guess Justin says, go see it. Uh, how about you, Mike? What do you think? Yeah. Ultimately uh, I say, see it. I f find the movie to be not wonderful. Like I said, it's not going to be on the top, 10 of the year by any way, shape or form, but it is angry, like punk rock art <laughs> that I feel like uh, needs to be seen. Even if the narrative buddy cop drama aspect of it has some shortcomings. So yeah, ultimately cool. I, I say it's important. See it. It's good. Uh, and probably the most interesting Spike Lee movie uh, since 25th hour in my, in my book. Mm. Cool. So before we move on into spoilers, guys, we had someone from Facebook send us a uh, question about Black Klansman. He says, I know I should watch this, but I just rewatched Do the Right Thing. Is Black Klansman just as emotionally scarring? And that was sent in by Forrest Gray Delozo. De oh my goodness. Delozier? 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 Sorry, Forrest, but thanks for the question. Yeah. I'm hoping at least uh, we got it right one time somewhere in there. <laughs> That's why I didn't even try. I hope so. All right. So, guys, do you think this movie is just as emotionally scarring as Do the Right Thing? I'll start us out on that because I have not seen Do the Right Thing, so I can't answer this question. So I'm going to have to back off and, and let you guys answer. I would say definitely go see uh, Do the Right Thing, Justin. It's probably Spike Lee's one of his better movies, for sure. It's my favorite but, one of his. Well, maybe 25th Hour, but... Uh, what I would say is, yeah, I think that th it's been a long time since I've seen Do the Right Thing, but I would say that this is uh, emotionally scarring. It's it, it definitely like got me riled up for sure. So I don't know if it's emotionally scarring, but it'll get you riled up for sure. It's not emotionally scarring, but Do the Right Thing wasn't emotionally scarring for me. I would say Do the Right Thing was very biting and very like relevant, and I would say that this is that times 10 all the emotions and things and do the right thing i felt also in black klansman but the way the end is constructed in black klansman is unlike anything spike lee has done before in in my opinion and is very unique just on a visceral level leaving the theater i had more of a reaction than the first time i saw the do the right thing although i don't know that it's as good of a movie yeah i'd agree there all right cool so thanks for that question, Forrest. And guys, are we ready to move on into spoilers? Yeah, yeah let's, let's spoil go. this. Let's do it. No, I guess Rosebud is just a piece in a jigsaw puzzle. Yeah, I'll tell you what. You know how many cigarettes you got up there? I'll tell you all about it. 
And here we go. In this movie, I feel like there are a lot of references to like the power of movies and cinema in general. Uh, it starts out with that famous scene from Gone with the Wind and its iconic imagery of, uh, I guess it's like the Battle of Atlanta. Yeah, so it's a ton of dead Confederate soldiers and then it right. kind of cranes up to reveal a Confederate flag like flapping. In the exactly, wind. and then I believe there's a quote at the beginning that says, we may have lost the battle, but we have not lost the war. And then later on in the movie, you have a speaker for the Black Panther movement. And he's talking about how whenever he was a child, he would go see Tarzan movies in the theaters and they would primarily feature uh, black people as the villains. Right. So Tarzan would have to beat up black people and And savages. Yeah. He remembers as a child, he would root for Tarzan to do that. Then there's also the scene where the KKK is actually watching Birth of a Nation, which... um, in real history, when Birth of the Nation came out, it was like unanimously praised. Everyone loved it, uh, despite its terrible racist subject matter. And it actually was responsible for uh, spawning the rebirth of the Ku Klux Klan, right? So Birth of a Nation is both important in what it did for movies and also important in what it did in society. Uh, and he uses Birth of a Nation in this film to like a really interesting way. There is a scene in the movie where Ron and his girlfriend, whom I can't remember her name, but the student activist, um, they're walking and they're talking about black exploitation movies and representation. And she's saying she has a problem with a lot of black exploitation movies because black people are represented as pimps or criminals in a lot of them, to which Ron would say, I mean, it's just a movie, but then cut to the birth of the nation scene where you see the KKK just getting so excited watching this movie. They're cheering on. It's like their mascot, you know, it's like their theme song almost. And so you see right here, Ron looking through the window, watching these KKK members watch birth of a nation. And you're seeing right then and there, he is understanding that it's never just a movie. The power of cinema is important and, and is, a, is a powerful tool. And I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, definitely. And why I representation is important too, right? Exactly. Representation can be super important. And we don't think about that uh, generally, like, or at least me as a white guy. You know, I don't <laughs> think about representation that much. But it's because we're already on the screen. Exactly. You know, we're we don't everywhere. have to think about it. Yeah. But it is important. And I think what Spike Lee is saying in this movie is that um, that kind of thing matters, you know, and he's right. Yeah. Well, that's part of what I think will hold on, right? Like that's the message that I think is going to still be relevant and maybe timeless to an extent. Like even if everything else that this movie's talking about is solved, like in an ideal world, like the point about how powerful cinema can be and what it can do is timeless. I have a quick story about working at Blockbuster and there was a guy that would come in and I, I, for some reason I was talking to him about American History X and he said how much, uh, like, and I said how much I liked it and he's like, yeah, I like the beginning part of it and he said specifically that he stopped the movie uh, once he switched sides. Uh, Edward Norton's character, American History X is, uh, Edward Norton is a, a racist Nazi and he eventually switches sides and becomes redeemed. But this guy would come into Blockbuster and rent it and stop the movie before he switched sides because he liked the part where he was a Nazi. And this is, you know, a place that, you know, we grew up in. Or, uh, you know, ah, it's just pretty ridiculous. And it, it, to think that these things don't happen in real life is, yeah, uh, it's naive. Naive, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty frustrating. And I'm somewhat disappointed in myself for not. <laughs> calling him out well i mean you can't make him watch the whole movie but no but i mean i can't be yeah, like and i, I know what you mean it's it's sad that like even movies that have a message <laughs> people can just like choose to ignore the message part of it and just not <laughs> it just will not get through you know yeah let me ask you guys this one of the characters i actually thought was kind of nuanced in this movie and one of the the most nuanced parts of the like kkk characters was the wife of the guy who was onto them. I don't know if you guys right. remember yep. her. 
I feel Wait, like, the, yeah, yeah did, she was an interesting was character. Nuanced? Yeah, like, she was almost too dumb to know what was really going on, or at least the way they played her in the movie. Like, there's a scene where the uh, she's laying in bed with her, her husband, to whom is, like, in the local chapter of the KKK. He's on to Ron Stallworth, and he's, like, our main antagonist for the most part, right? Mm-hmm. Um, there's a scene where they are in bed together, and she talks about how She's like, you know, I'm so thankful that you gave me purpose in my life. Like, I'm so thankful that, like, I found you and you gave me something to believe in. And then, like, later, whenever they're watching Birth of a Nation, she's, like, the most overly excited versus anyone in the room, right? She's like, the inspiration, you know, like, so the way I read her character was, this is not her cause. She is just a lost soul who found a husband And she's just going to identify with his cause, no matter what it is, so she can belong. And I think that's a type of racist that Spike Lee wants to shine a light on in this movie, right? Which is the kind of racist that, like, probably doesn't believe it heart and soul and want to be a martyr of it. But it's part of the club. You know, if it's an accepting club for them. It it felt, I, I agree with you, but it felt more along the lines of, like, Stockholm Syndrome. Like, and I don't, I don't think there's any evidence. Maybe, but she's not a kidnap victim. No, I, I'm not, yeah, and I didn't mean, but like she's just part of this, and she's adopted it because she she loves her husband so much, and she's just got to shout this stuff out. And I don't think that that's like I have in my notes actually written to talk about casual racism, is uh, what I called it. Um, yeah, she's more than casual. She's talking about yeah, blowing people up. But what I would right. say is yeah. this is not her default. Like, this is not She her didn't manifesto. start off that way. Yeah, like, she found someone, and they adopted her into the club, and so she could belong. She went along with it. Yeah. And I think I, that is a dangerous type of racist. What you saying, Justin? It is, but I, I, I don't think that I agree with your reading of her character, because if for no other reason than that, that's a bit, like, reading deep into it, and, like, a bit subtle of a thing for spike lee to do in this movie and i feel like if he was really tackling that it would have been a lot more on the nose with it because to me it she just felt you know as racist as anybody else in the movie and like kind of in in line with the other people i didn't really get a different vibe from her and i just as with everything else i never felt the need to read anything else so maybe it's there and that was the one part of the movie i I think it's there to be subtle with i think it's there i i would recommend watching it again which i doubt you will but i think it's there to be honest i don't know what do you think chris yeah i don't know that spike lee comes out and overtly says anything but she's definitely not part of the group and she wants to be part of the group does that make sense like yeah, but that's because she's a woman not because she's less racist or it's not her cause i think she i think she aspires to be i think she feels the same way well but she's a woman so she's not treated equally and that's her that's what she wants that's what she strives for but isn't that why she's so loud and vocal about her racism is to make up for everything yeah, she's else, overcompensating. all her def- deficiencies and not being part of the club is kind of the way I felt about it. She's trying to show her husband, look, I'm just as racist as you are, <laughs> you know? Right. I'm and that's part- kind of what I'm saying, right? Which is like, this is not like she's in this because her husband is in this, but she's still just as bad. Well, I'm not I saying she's not just agree. as bad. Yeah, you know, for sure. She's terrible and she she's a completely terrible person. But what I'm saying is like she's not the one like planning around like or she's not the one sitting around planning to like they use her. Basically, they use right. her to deliver their bomb. Like they don't give her the same respect. They don't give her the same like acknowledgement. She's literally just like uh, the person they they are using. And she's a garbage person. Also, I think what Spike Lee is saying is that. Being a member of a club is enough for some people, like acceptance. And it's enough for them to, to go along with things and, and do things. And like I said, uh, you know, the, like this isn't explicitly stated in the movie. It seems more nuanced, but that's the way I read her character. Yeah, that's interesting. I wonder, because I thought the same thing afterwards, but I, I was like, but there's not a lot of evidence in the movie to point us that way. Is that us reading into it or insinuating? That was me, yeah, we've... that's me reading into like the scene where the way she's acting in like the scene where they're in bed together and they're mm-hmm. talking about blowing it up and she's like, oh, we've talked about it for so long. I can't yeah. believe it's finally here. I never thought it would actually arrive. You know, like I, I'm so thankful you gave me a purpose. I didn't get anything out of that more than like genuine excitement and like 
joy out of hating black people so much. Okay. Like uh, I didn't get any note from, from her. I mean, there, the, you're, there's the part where she says like, you know, you're going to end a life. And once you do it, you can't take it back. I think that's more about murder in general than it is like a, uh, I yeah. may be questioning this. I think it's more questioning murder. Did you guys find any nuance in the whole idea of the woman that, uh, Ron is hanging out with, uh, I think her name is Pam. No, is it not Pam? Patrice. Her name is Patrice. Uh, when they're talking and she's talking about how she basically is treating like cops, like they're all bad. Right. And of course, Ron is a cop. She doesn't know that. I thought there was a bit of nuance to that discussion, which is ultimately by the end of the movie, none of that cop versus black people stuff is real, really matters when it comes down to it, because it's a lot more about like the KKK and Trump and white supremacy. Oh, I, I think sort of I, stuff. I think I disagree with that. Uh, I think that yeah, the, me too. The ending tells me, tells us a lot about how Spike Lee feels about police. I, that is a really good conversation. I, I did want to bring up it's both sides, both the uh, KKK and the black Panther movement call the cops pigs. Um, I think I, I read an article with Washington, um, and he had rode around with some cops to kind of get acclimated to the part and stuff. And he was talking about how there's a few bad apples, uh, and they're kind of sometimes in a no-win situation. I mean, I'm not defending anything that, that has happened with cops. It's just an interesting thing that, you know, cops are kind of stuck in the middle of this thing, and neither side like them. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's why I think there's there's nuance, right? Because yeah, you actually have a cop, and he is trying to tell you, it's like, well, not all cops are bad or whatever, you know. And like he's like, don't call us, you know, don't call them pigs. That's yeah, you know, call them cops, call them police. He's trying to instill respect, which is, I guess, to me, that was like the most nuanced thing in the movie, and something that I was, I thought, was an an interesting conversation. Well, the whole movie kind of sets this up even with like the Black Panther movement at the beginning of the movie, right? Because you have Ron Stallworth going to see the speaker for the Black Panther movement. And in it, he says like, you know, um, I'd rather see you guys like shoot a racist cop than like a Vietnamese person or something like that, right? And whenever Ron gets back to the police station the cops are like super concerned with all the violence that might be done by the black panthers and then when ron starts to infiltrate the kkk they seem significantly less interested in the violence that might be done by that particular group so i think it's also interesting to show like the way the two quote-unquote hate groups are treated one of the more specific things where we watch it's the cutting between the uh the clan rally when uh adam driver is initiated into it mm -hmm. and then uh the black panther movement and cutting between the two of them and showing what they're talking about and what they are celebrating and in the the black panther it's about a guy talking about how uh one of his friends was lynched and cut up into little pieces and sold uh and i thought that was uh, a really powerful scene especially cutting between the two of them and then you see the clan like celebrating moments like that in watching rebirth or birth of a nation and i i thought that, that was very powerful uh showing that no these these aren't both hate groups and they're not the same, you know? And I thought that I, I thought that was really powerful. Yeah. And also uh, just fun side history lesson there for cinema, like the editing technique, parallel editing, which is what DW Griffith uh, like originated in birth of a nation, which is like, you know, there's action going on over here and then you can cut away for a minute and show action going on over there to create tension. That's the same technique being used in that scene. Whenever they're actually watching birth of a nation, when it's cross-cutting over to Harry Belafonte talking about the lynching, which, yeah, mm -hmm. which is pretty interesting, I think. I've seen that brought yeah, up in a, a few other reviews. It's a nice touch. And I, I did like uh, that Harry Belafonte gave that speech. I, I believe he walked across the bridge with Martin Luther King in Selma, so I thought that was a, a good casting choice. Yeah, and that seems like the most Spike Lee scene in the whole movie. That and the actual Black Panther rally where it shows like all their faces listening to him. And it's just like, yeah. it's just like their faces, like against like a black screen that yeah. seemed like such a Spike Lee 
scene to me. And, yeah, uh, it was very stylized and it was it was interesting. I've read yeah, that I liked it. that's a reference to some like 1970s ads uh, that were like black is beautiful ads where it's like black background and just kind of a light on someone like someone's face. Mm hmm. Right. Um, so I think he was, from what I understand, he was referencing those ads with that, which is, which is cool. And it, it feels like a reference when you're watching it. You were like, this is obviously, at least to me, I thought like he's obviously referencing some sort of imagery. Yeah. I, so I did some research into it at the time. There's a few shots in the movie that just seem like they're straight out of like black exploitation movies, you know, like yeah. there is one shot at the end where they're like on a conveyor belt or something like that. And they are just standing there They're being dollied down the hallway yeah yeah it's, it's, like, it's at the end whenever they're the cross the burning. door gets knocked on and they come out and there's a cross being burnt yeah i, I really and, dig that shot yeah. too I, I like stuff like that yeah that's that's my favorite shot of the movie and in some ways like i wish that they had leaned into that a little bit more like because they in some ways they are doing this sort of black exploitation style and at moments or like this sort of like stylized filmmaking but i felt like it's a little bit far and few in between to really feel cohesive to me. Like I, I, w I was, I like once that came at the end, I was like, man, I kind of wish some more of the movie had been like stylized. Yeah. Just maybe. For entertainment uh, sake. Yeah. I could see like maybe a little flourishes like that, but I also, I like the movie the way it is. Cause I feel like he, he was trying to make a specific point and probably didn't want to get burdened down with style. Yeah. But maybe not, you know, I, you're right. It, I could always use more cool shots like that yeah yeah I'm, yeah speaking purely on a fun point it, it would really have no effect on like the message or what he's trying to say at all to do that yeah it would just be maybe a fun so let me ask you this justin you were saying that you didn't feel like uh john david washington or adam driver's performances were very interesting and that's probably where i disagree the most of everything you've said um i thought john david washington was super watchable and adam driver as always is, is also very watchable. What, what do you think was missing from their performances? Uh, it's, I mean, it's hard to quantify, right. To, to when like you're just not connecting with the performance and not, uh, not feeling anything from them. Like I, I think it goes beyond just like their particular performances. I think it comes down to script and the way that the film is edited and the mood. Like, like I never, I never at any point was like worried for any of them or, like laughed along with any of them because I didn't think it was funny. It just seems so like I, I never really liked any either one of them. They seem so like middle of the road, sort of like understated performances that I don't know. I just never, I never felt that connection with them where like, I understand what they're feeling right now or I like them. Does that make sense? Um, I mean, it, the words you're saying make sense, but the the meaning behind them just does not connect to me. <laughs> yeah. in, it's hard all. to be specific because I mean, I could literally any scene in the movie I could point out, right? So, like, it, I mean, it's hard to be specific. Sure. Well, okay. I'll I'll just give a like a counterpoint. Um, like for example, the scene whenever Adam Driver has to take the lie detector test, and the guy's like, "Pull down your pants," and he has the gun on him. And he has to, and then uh, Ron has to get out of the car real quick and go throw a rock through the window. That was suspenseful for me for for a little bit, anyway. I mean, I wasn't on the edge of my seat the same way I am, like a genuine thriller or like you know Mission Impossible Fallout or something like that. That like the whole movie is designed for that reason. But I was into the characters I mean, enough to buy that scene, you know. The person I went with to see the movie afterwards, she thought she's like. I wouldn't have put it past by Spike Lee just to change history, like Quentin Tarantino did uh in inglorious bastards just to make a point so she was even more worried she's like because you know it's a true story but she was like maybe spike lee's gonna you know kill these characters just to make a point <laughs> so yeah th that was her take on it yeah I, I think that the one point where i didn't necessarily know what was gonna happen because even though it's a true story i imagine there's a good amount of people going to see the movie that don't know the true story and don't know what happened so it you know for our all in tens and purposes like it might as well be a fiction story for me because i don't i don't know what's going to happen right right and there, so there was a one point where i was slightly worried about him and that's like the end whenever the cops come up and they're going to arrest ron immediately yeah, and like just... i worried that he was going to get shot oh, before yeah. he could do anything yeah that was but specifically that, that what gets, she was talking about yeah that gets curtailed pretty quickly but i, I will give that that moment that but that's you know, that's built a little bit off of current events and other things yeah. they talk about for the whole, you know, first like 20 ish minutes of the movie. 
Yeah. Yeah. I think the scene I liked with Adam Driver was when he's talking about his Jewishness and how he's never really had to deal with it because he is white, you know, like, and so he just kind of, he doesn't celebrate it very much. He just goes through life, whereas it's difficult, you know, for black people, they, they can't do that. Uh, they can't hide it. Yeah. And it made him really think, and I thought that was a really uh, good performance from Adam Driver in that scene. Yeah, I agree. That was one of my favorite scenes in the whole movie, actually, was when yeah. he's like, I'd never thought about being Jewish, but now that's all I'm thinking about, you know? I did kind of want to get into that casual racism, which that last scene kind of gets into, uh, where they they show up, the white woman is there who actually did the crime, yeah, and then the actual, the black like, criminal. Yeah, and then the black man's there, and they of course they come and uh, beat him up. But I think that casual racism is prominent in the whole movie and especially the ending i think and i'm and i'm talking about the ending before the the big ending right and right. so what we get is uh you know they've infiltrated the ku klux klan they did it there's a racist cop and they catch him on tape saying a bunch of racist things everybody's like happy and excited and they've kicked him off the police force and everybody's working as a team, you know, like yeah. hand in hand, we're going to eradicate racism. Yeah. And then the next scene is, and this is the casual racism part. They go into the office and the head guy, it, the chief of police is like, we're, we're shutting this down and you have to destroy all your uh, right. evidence. Yeah. And that's the casual racism. Like there are good cops, but... <laughs> The system is what institutionalized racism. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's like uh, they get done doing the infiltrating the Klan mission. Adam Driver and John David Washington and the whole team are like being buddies. And you're like, this is so happy. This is like completely silly. Right. But that's because he's yeah. about to hit you over the head with, you know. Um, a couple of things. A couple of things. Yeah. Well, I think the implication is that they're starting to come down on cops or whatever but like to have this story and have it, those sort of things go public because of the people that are in the kkk right they can't that's gonna hurt them as a police force probably right so there are a couple so other kind of protecting their ass exactly and, and there are a couple other scenes throughout the movie that show that exact kind of racism in work as well um, especially from the chief yeah yeah especially from the chief and even there's even a scene where like they're all talking about like the the public perception of Muhammad Ali at the time and even mm-hmm. like Adam Driver's character who the one we consider generally like the the non-racist good white guy in the movie right even he has a moment where he like they all kind of laugh together collectively like him the chief and like some other white guy in the room about how Muhammad Ali is no good because he's, you know, protesting Vietnam or something like that, right? Even those characters have very minor, like, microaggressions, kind of, you know what I mean? Right. Throughout the movie, like, even the ones that are good, and I think th- that's where the nuance in the movie lies, is, is those kinds of scenarios, not necessarily in, uh, you know, the lines that they're actually saying, but, like, in the context of the scenes. Yeah, it's the the casual racism, I think, and that's... Because we expect it from the KKK, right? And we maybe even expect it from the chief of police. But when it's mm-hmm. Adam Driver's character or the other guy, uh, the par- Adam Driver's partner. Yeah, that's when it hurts you know, the like, most. Yeah, and it's that casual racism that's probably the most important thing to stop, right? Because if you stop the casual racism, you'll stop the most more offensive racism, right? Yeah, the more outright. Yeah. Right. All right, so yeah, after the overly happy buddy cop stuff... Then all of a sudden, Spike Lee really hits you with what he's trying to say. And he has footage from Charlottesville and a couple other alt-right rallies, right, where actual white nationalists are meeting in public and and marching and chanting white nationalist racist chants, you know. And uh, that is how he chooses to end the movie with some very ominous music. (laughs) Yeah, he has Mm -hmm. David Duke quoting Trump. And yeah, exactly. And is Trump talking to? Exactly. So this is the thesis of the movie, right? This is the this is like, hey, remember all those lines that we were hitting you over the head with earlier in the movie? If they didn't hit home then, they will now. <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, yeah. 
And I remember when it was over in my theater, there was an otherwise very like loud, uh, enthusiastic theater. Like you could hear a pin drop uh, when it was over, you know? Yeah. I haven't walked away from a movie like that uh, in a long time that left you with that kind of like, damn. Uh, the other thing is, you know, he's like, yeah, this movie took place 70 years or not 70. It This movie took place in the 70s. Uh, you think that's all over? Take a look here. It's not over. Yeah, it's happening uh, now. <laughs> We may have won the battle, but we have not yet won the war, or whatever, or lost the war. The quote from uh, Gone with the Wind. And then and then the most striking image is the upside-down American flag. And how do you guys feel about that? It reminded me of that Tommy Lee Jones movie from a few years back in the Valley of Elah. Uh-huh. Um, it had a very similar um, sentiment at the end with uh, with the flag. But uh, ultimately, I found it to be effective. Like I said, and like Justin has said... Um, all of this is a little too blunt to be like artistically satisfying, like long term for me to like consider it like one of my best of the year. But as a like call to action or as a political statement movie, it is effective. And, you know, judging from all the reactions I've seen on social media and people who have tweeted at us about it. Um, you know, people are responding to it for sure. So anyway, I just think it's really interesting and yeah, apparently people are, are digging it. How about you, Justin, since you're the most uh, negative on the film, how do you feel about that ending sequence? Was it too much or how do you feel? I don't think it was too much. I mean, I think that's where Spike Lee is really saying what he wants to say. And I feel like by that point in the movie, as you said, Mike, if you haven't gotten it, it's really you know, driving the point home and then taking that one step further. And as you said, like showing us, look, this is still going on today, or we haven't eradicated this today. This is like, yes, this is set in the seventies, but yeah. our most president, of the things we talk about it, they're still, they're still a problem. They're still relevant issues. Right. Yeah. Like I yeah. showed you and, a goofy buddy comedy, but let's be real for a second. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll see. If, so for me, I almost wish that the rest of the movie had been a little bit more goofy so that this could hammer home harder and kind of take like a harder left turn. But by this point in the movie, I think I was enough in that mindset that I don't think this was as effective as it could have been, in my opinion. And then also this is sort of, to me, like the main takeaway, the main message is what like wraps it up. And and it's the part of me that felt like, you know, I kind of wish this had been (laughs) almost a documentary about this thing or something, you know, or, or I could have gotten this, message in a shorter so like when i said earlier like i would i think i could have gotten most of this out of a youtube video or six minute youtube video or whatever i said it like this is part of what i'm thinking about is like yes it was effective yes it's good but necessitating the two hours and 10 minutes before that moment i i I don't know yeah i think what trump says is why he made this movie or at least like when trump refuses to condemn nazis and he says there's bad people on both sides. That's that's a lot of what this movie is trying to do, is showing, look, these are the KKK, and this is what they're doing. They, they just want to, you know, it's all about white pride, and they're the most maligned group. Uh, the white man is the most maligned group in the United States. The, the most, um, they're the most discriminated against group. And then you see the Black Panthers, and you see why they, <laughs> they're justified, you know? And... The fact that, you know, Trump wouldn't condemn Nazis is, is just like that's the reaction and that's why he made this film. And I yeah, and I'm I'm glad he did. Well that goes with the the whole thing where they they shut down the investigation and make him burn all the evidence. It's it's the same as Trump not calling out Nazis. Right. Yeah. Uh it really riled me up for sure. <laughs> so yeah. So I know we've been talking a lot about the message and, and the point in the movie and all of that. But I I would, if you guys are okay with it, I'd like to talk about the actual movie and like the story and the plot and and that sort of things. And some of my problems with it, you know, I've I've said that I don't like the film and most of my dislike of the film is based in that. So I would like to talk about that a little bit. Sure. Absolutely. I'm leery about it, but you can go ahead. (laughs) Yeah. Explain yourself. Yeah. 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 I, I, I feel like I should. So I guess I'll start, I'll start with sort of like a bigger, more macro concept. And the f- first thing that I kind of felt, and maybe this is explained in the trailer, because I only watched the trailer once and I don't remember it, but I feel like the premise that we're given in the title and the poster 
is not the movie that we get. I think we get a really interesting premise, which is a black man infiltrates the KKK. And on the poster, there's a, a person in a KKK hood and we can see their skin like through the neck and like through the eyes, I think, or something like that. And it's very clearly a black person under a hood. Well, in the movie, they only cross paths once, the KKK and Ron Stallworth, right? It's all Adam Driver going to actually talk to them, who is a white guy infiltrating the KKK, which is honestly not as interesting. And so I was pretty disappointed in that. I don't know if you guys felt that or did you know that going in? I didn't know it going in, but uh, that made it more believable and less zany and like silly comedy-esque. Right. Because like, I mean, a black man can't actually infiltrate the KKK like physically with him there with a hood on, like talking to them because it wouldn't work out. Isn't that what makes the plot sellable? I mean, maybe if if I were going to this movie, like expecting that plot, maybe I would be disappointed. But I was sold on Spike Lee and word of mouth and its cultural relevance and it's the conversation around it. Right. So. Like, I wasn't looking forward to that movie, so I don't feel like I was robbed of that plot line. Yeah, the trailer lets you know that it's going to be Adam Driver infiltrating the KKK. I would be interested in knowing how you, how the, how he would actually, Ron Stallworth, would infiltrate the KKK. Like, would he have to, like, cover his face the whole time, or? It seems like, like it would be just be like that Dave Chappelle skit. <laughs> yeah, or uh, Shock right. Corridor. Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, or he'd basically he'd have to be in like a a hood the whole time, which is kind of what you thought. I it mean, was honestly, be. that's what the poster says. Hmm. <laughs> I, and then, and I felt like I got a less interesting premise. And I think on the point of like it not making sense for him to do that, I agree. But to me, it also doesn't make sense that Ron has to still make the phone calls. Like it's just asking for the whole plan to go wrong and them to get caught by sending Adam driver and have Ron talk on the phone. And I, and I know that like, it's based on a true story, but it still seems like a bad plan. And it seems like a dumb idea. To oh, me. right. Like, why Wait. not? Okay. Just have Adam driver take over the phone. Right. Calls? Okay. So what you're saying is since they're meeting Adam driver and they're hearing his voice in person, it would have been easier to just transition Adam driver into taking over the phone calls. Like once they yes. met him. Yeah. yeah, that does make sense. But in theory, I guess um, Adam Driver's not the savvy, uh, smooth talker that Ron Stallworth is, uh, I guess, in the movie. I mean, even though he has to do the smooth talking in person. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he's got to do it in person. He can surely do it over the phone. Sure. I, I would say in real life, that's how it worked. I saw an interview with um, Ron Stallworth, the real Ron Stallworth, and then that's how it, it worked. Uh, he was the voice on the phone, and... Uh, the other guy, Adam Driver's character, went in. And I do think we do get a little bit of that somebody that's not supposed to infiltrate the KKK infiltrating him. Actually, two people. We have Ron Stallworth, who's a black man, and then we have uh, Adam Driver's character, who is Jewish. So I think we do get that a little bit. There is a little bit of a, are you Jewish? You know, uh, that kind of, if they find out that he's Jewish, he's in trouble, right? So we do get it a little bit. Yeah, but in a more believable way to where he can actually have face-to-face conversations because as we see in the movie i mean the kkk they meet more often like not in hoods and disguises right you know than they do in hoods and disguises so yeah i hear what you're saying y- you felt lied to i just don't see how they could have possibly made a movie especially one based on a true story i just get well i mean they they, they take other liberties with the true story-ness of it for one well yeah like sure um they, there's actually not a lot known about adam driver's character yeah and for sure, he wasn't Jewish in real life. Oh, really? I didn't... Yeah, and the, the girlfriend is uh, supposedly invented, too. Um, yeah, so, but I the mean, girlfriend it, doesn't really have any bearing story. on the plot, though, so that makes sense. She's there for thematic value. Which is value. another issue that I have with the movie. <laughs> uh, but that's not one that I really want to talk about, but because it's not that important, as you said. But the... I think... Go Sorry, ahead. an interesting thing from the interview that I saw was, yeah, he doesn't even give adam driver's character's real name uh the real ron stallworth calls him chuck he's like that's not his real name but that's what we'll call him so that's interesting right yeah it makes sense if he's an undercover agent yeah yeah and 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 i know that it's a true story but i mean i think that not every story that's true is makes a good movie (laughs) and that's ultimately where i come down on that aspect of the movie but we can kind of move on to something else a a little bit uh, because i do want to talk about the 
scene where Adam Driver has to learn to talk like Ron on the on the how how Ron talks on the phone. There's like this whole scene that where he's doing that. And once Adam Driver actually shows up to me, he's just talking like Adam Driver. I got no sense that he was doing a Ron voice at all. Like it just sounded like Adam Driver to me. It doesn't sound anything like Ron Stallworth to me. And that could be okay if they do anything with it. But the only thing that comes out of it is like, I think once or twice in the movie, someone says like, Oh, well you sound different on the phone. And he's like, yep. And then that's it. Like it's, it's, doesn't even factor into why the Felix character is super suspicious of Adam Driver at all. Um, yeah, that's I'm a little more sympathetic to that point. Um, I think ultimately they give you a scene where he kind of like practices Ron's voice for a minute. But ultimately, I think that scene is really just there for like a buddy cop bonding moment because it kind of just turns into like a fun doing impressions of one another kind of scene. Um, that's kind of like lighthearted and they do kind of drop that angle as soon as Adam Driver shows up to try to infiltrate the KKK. I do agree with you on that point, but ultimately I don't want to see Adam Driver doing a weird voice the rest of the movie either. So I don't know what the solution would have been, but maybe not making such a big deal about it or maybe making a bigger deal about it. I'm not sure, but yeah. I, 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 mean, I think if saying. you have that scene in there, yeah, if you have that scene in there, I think you you have to do it or you you take that scene out. And I might even be more forgiving. Like to me, I don't even remember anything clever or funny happening with that scene. It was just like them kind of making fun of the way he talks or whatever, or like having fun with that. Right. And like, I, I don't know. It's like, it's like, I know what you mean that they, they, it seems like they threw it in there to have that sort of fun scene. But like in the end, the scene wasn't even very fun, like, or funny. And it, to me, well, it just, 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 I mean, it may not have been a funny to you, but a lot of the scenes of like the buddy cop stuff, I think Spike Lee throws in there to make it more palatable because he's also throwing a lot heavier stuff at you in between all that. Right. So like all the buddy cop stuff is almost just there to be like very corny. I think very much just to attach you to these guys and, and, and show you that, Hey, you know what? Not every, um, interracial friendship or relationship between people in this movie has to be terrible, right? There can be people getting along and having uh, fun conversations, you know, and and we can celebrate our differences as well. You know, I think that's why they're in there is just so it's not so overwhelmingly depressing, not necessarily because it's laugh out loud funny. Yeah, I mean, I I understand what you mean. And I think in that sense, I I guess that they, they end up like going for a relatively bland scene, I guess. I don't know. Like, as opposed to making a scene actually funny, because maybe it doesn't fit with the movie. It's like, I don't know. There were, and there were a lot of scenes like that that I could tell. It's like, it's like they wanted to put this scene in there to be lighthearted. But in the end, they just didn't have either the the comedy chops or whatever to actually make the scene funny. And I, and I don't know, maybe let me ask you guys this. But like, I felt the film was attempting to be a very dark comedy a lot of the time. So when I talk about the film not being funny, it's because I feel like the film is failing at being funny. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess my bigger question, did you think that the film was intending to be a dark comedy? Chris, what do you think? Yeah, I think it it was a dark comedy. Yeah, uh, for sure. And for me, uh, a lot of the jokes did succeed. I, I don't necessarily remember specifically the voice scene, but stuff like when he's talking to David Duke, that doesn't surprise me. Uh, right. But like stuff, <laughs> like when he's talking to David Duke and situations like that were always really, I thought funny. Uh, l- well, like, how do you know a black man? How do you know I'm not black? And he's like, because you're not saying, what was it? Shoah? Like he was making some sort of one word into two. Ara. Ara yeah. One word into two yeah. syllables. Hang Hold on. on. Not one word into two syllables, like yeah, one syllable into two syllables. Yeah, I, I thought that was right. funny, and I think making fun of the the Klansmen uh, a lot of times was funny. Uh, but I also think that that is the only joke in the movie, just about like the whole premise of the movie, or at least like the humor, dark comedy aspect of it. And it's something I ha- I kind of have an issue with is, and I feel like, and uh, I mean, it feels like they saw the concept of like of like these. KKK people are so dumb that they're going to get duped by a black guy. And obviously I'm not upset that the KKK are the butt of jokes because 
they have been in movies past. They should be because they're deplorable and awful people. What I what upsets me about it is the laziness of the writing and the laziness of making a what I think is attempting to be a dark comedy and not doing anything more entertaining and relying on a one note joke. Like that's what makes me mad about it is that and not mad, but like upset that the movie wasn't funnier because it seems like there's a lot of potential to like milk a lot of comedy, but they really just rely on like our hatred of the KKK to be funny because it's like, they're stupid. Isn't like, that's funny. Well, I think I maintain that Spike Lee did that on purpose in the way that birth of a nation, uh, stereotypes, the black characters in that, and yeah. I think that's his way of like representation matters. He wants to represent them as fools. Yeah, but you could you could do more on top of that. I guess what I feel is that that they thought like, well, that's good enough. That's good enough because everyone hates the KKK so much that this will get us through an entire movie. And for some people, it might. But just uh, like it felt one note to me after a while, after maybe the first like 30, 40 minutes of dealing with the KKK, I didn't really feel they built on that humor at all. And like, so the joke got old to me as a, as a joke, not as a criticism of the KKK. Cause you know, I, I will always stand by criticism of the KKK, no matter how much I hear it, that really can't really get old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I guess I could see your point. It just didn't do that for me you know yeah. I, I, didn't, I didn't necessarily get tired i can i understand what you're saying but i just didn't feel that way i hear what you're saying uh but i disagree respectfully so i disrespectfully okay. disagree let me let me ask do you think this is the biggest disagreement we've had uh like uh, watching the show i mean not disagreement but the biggest difference in uh how whether we like the movie or not uh because i i really feel like you don't like it at all, and both Mike and I really liked it. So that's an interesting. I think might be our our biggest disagreement on a movie, and I, it feels. Yeah, I mean, maybe the the other closest one I remember might be like Annihilation. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, that one was pretty big, but I I would say this one's the biggest, but it's also the most divisive movie. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's the kind of like if someone doesn't like it and someone does, it's going to be pretty divisive. Yeah. Which is fine. It's all. I mean, it's all opinions. Yeah, absolutely. And I think. I think the important thing is that we all, all of us agree with the message. Yeah, KKK is bad. <laughs> yeah. At least none of us are like pissed off about that. Cause that would be pretty weird. Yeah. I think the podcast would dissolve if one of us was dif differing on that opinion. Yeah. If one of us were like, the KKK has some very fine people. <laughs> I mean, no one would say that. Or Nobody that Trump said. would possibly say that. Oh, Trump did. <laughs> oh, that's right. We live in a world where nothing means anything anymore. <laughs> and everything's going to hell okay yeah oh yeah all I right. forgot. Well, all right well thank you guys for for letting me you know talk about the movie a little bit more and this is like a very long episode yeah very long so i look forward to editing this it, <laughs> I'm, I'm i'm a little happy this one didn't fall on my plate but i'm sure i'll get my come up and <laughs> yeah at some point i'm going to <laughs> just find a movie and nitpick the shit out of it whenever you have to edit <laughs> something yeah that's fair. I, I accept that as punishment. <laughs> All right. Well, so I guess nothing else, right? Anybody got anything else on the movie? No, I'm good. Yeah, that does it for me. So that's two recommends oh. and a don't recommend. Yeah. I mean, I recommend the message, but I think you can get that other places. Um, I don't know that it's worth sitting through an hour and 40 minute movie, but I mean, maybe. <laughs> and I think it's, I think it's going to be different for each person. So take a chance. You might hate it. You might not. Most people seem to like it. So chances are you'll like it. Yeah. All right. So I think that does it for this episode, right? I think so. Does it for me. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for listening. Thanks, Jake Wagner Russell, for doing our intro and outro music. If you want to hear more of his music, you can do so at soundcloud.com slash bopscotch. All right. Next week, we'll be reviewing Crazy Rich Asians. Yeah. Most likely, I guess, unless yeah. something better comes along. But I've actually heard that that movie is good. It, I... Last I checked, it has a 100% on Rotten Tomatoes right now yep. from like 30 reviews. That's what I hear. So we shall see. Cool. Well, if you have any questions on Crazy Rich Asians you want us to answer on the show, you can send those to our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Casual Cinecast. And don't forget to review us on iTunes. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's especially important for us to say this, especially on this episode. If you guys have any thoughts on Black Klansmen or anything that we said 
write in. Let us know, and we will uh, definitely address it and talk to you guys about it uh, for sure. It's definitely a conversation that needs to be needs to happen. So, thanks so much for listening. Yeah, thanks a lot. See you later. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you.